You know, when I was 19 years old, I went to visit my motorbike crazy friend, Weasel. And she at the time owned a silver Suzuki Street Magic that she absolutely loved. But being a very sacrificial type of friend, she decided to let me, Johanna Koval, person with no license or previous driving experience, have a go on her beloved bike. And so she took me out to a farm area, and there was a, an area probably around the size of this auditorium, and she was like, Johanna, you're allowed on my bike, but there is one rule. You must stay in this area. And I was like, no problems, Weasel. I know what I'm doing. And she's like, yep, but Johanna, before you leave on my motorbike, you need to know this. That see this lever here on the handle? That is not the brake. That is the accelerator. And I was like, that's no problems. And I got on her bike and I took off. And I went round and round that gravel area. But after a while, I got a little bit <clears throat> tired of the gravel area. And with relief, I spied freedom down a cliffside road. And without looking back, I took that bike and I pushed that bike as hard as I possibly could and I went harder and faster. And I don't know if you've ever been in this experience before, but if you push a bike really hard, what happens is it takes off and your body doesn't quite keep up. And so I could feel the bike kind of, you know, was almost semi-flying. And I started freaking out because I could see that I was getting very close to this cliff's edge and so in fright, I thought I need to put those brakes on. And so I reached for the lever of that arm. And then I knew that there was no chance for me. As I watched the tiny pebbles turn to huge rocks and I, I neared that cliff's edge and suddenly I was catapulted over. And I was caught by this tree dangling looking at the river below, thinking, oh my gosh, there is a purpose for my life. <laughs> and as I dangled there, all I could do was yell for my friend, weasel, weasel, save me. Now my weasel friend, she's very different from me. She's got dreadlocks and she's like real farm girl, real motorbike chick. She just casually just walks down the road. And do you know what she did? True story, she saved her bike first. <laughs> so good, eh? And I wonder, I wonder how many times in life that we get in the situation where it feels amazing, it feels incredible in Jesus, but then we spy freedom down a cliffside face road. Well, we start going in that direction and, and we find ourselves caught by a tree and we're wondering how the heck we're going to get out of it. Maybe it's relational fallout. Maybe it's an inner sin and struggle that you just don't want to tell anyone else about and, and it just slowly but surely creeps up on you until you find yourself trapped. My job is with young people and I cannot get over I do a lot of counselling over messenger. I cannot get over how many young people are trapped in a world that nobody else knows about. We can go down a road and be trapped. And in our Christian lives, when we're walking with Jesus, we just have something inside of us that we're not quite letting go of, not quite allowing God to free us from. And we're dangling. And we're thinking... I can't save myself. I cannot save myself. See, the thing is, is that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And Jesus says this, I have come that every single one of you in this room could have life and have it absolutely and utterly to the full. But the devil wants to get in, doesn't he? He wants to drive the wedge in where it feels okay, we feel like we're all right if we just go down this, down this road a little bit more. And we end up in a place where we're absolutely and utterly unable to save ourselves. You know, I was doing some research and I came across the story about the shark and a marine bi biologist and she wanted to do some research. So what she did is in this massive tank, she got the shark and she put a fiberglass piece 
in the middle of the tank. And then she put these, these bait fish on the other side of the fiberglass. And the shark got really excited. It's circling you know, the tank and it goes straight for those little fish. And as it does, it bangs up against the fiberglass and it gets like a fright of its life. And, and it keeps doing it over and over and over again, up against the fiberglass, up against the fiberglass, up against the fiberglass. And eventually the shark gives up and it just goes back to its circling. So the marine biologist decided to remove that fiberglass sheet and the shark continued to circle. The bait fish was still there. But the shark believed in his little tiny brain that the fiberglass was still there. That there was no way that the shark was going to be able to go over to where the little fish were to get his food. See, that kind of thing can lead the shark to starvation, right? And see, there are things that we choose in life, but there's also this. Sometimes things happen to us that are completely outside of our control, and it's like that sheet of fiberglass. We get so used to the situation in our mind that we don't even try and go there. You know, I know this week that there's someone in this room, even if there's one of you, where this sermon's going to be for you. And the reason is this. Is this week, I had to go and sit with a CEO to try and negotiate $5,000 off the table for a youth event that I run for 2,000 young people. And as I was driving up to meet with the CEO, I was having all these thoughts of, Johanna, you're just not good enough. Johanna, you're not going to be able to do this. And I sat across the table from her and I was thinking these thoughts. I then had to deal with a marketer. And the marketing person was really difficult. And once again, I was going, man, I feel like a failure. I actually ended up texting my PA and saying, I feel really inadequate. And she rang me. She's like, Joe, what's wrong with you? <laughs> You're good at your job. I was like, I feel really unworthy. There's someone in this room this morning, and you feel unworthy. There's been a situation in your life that's become like fiberglass to you. And God is saying that he is a God that removes the fiberglass. Do you believe that this morning? He wants to remove the fiberglass in your life from the situation that's told you that you're not good enough. That maybe you can't go as far as you were hoping to go in life. That maybe you can't restore a relationship that is broken. That maybe you can't exist in the church well again. For a while I believed that if I came back to this place that nobody would want me here. That was not a reflection on the church, that was a reflection on the fiberglass in my life of what I believed. What do you believe? What do you believe that could completely hold you back? I went to Postgate School, but I came from Cannons Creek, my house was right here. And at the time that going to Postgate School from Cannons Creek over to Whitby, the kids there thought that my sister and I were like, not cool at all. Not cool for school. And they, they mocked us. Like we, we wore clothes that my mum would patch up with love hearts because there were holes in them. And, and they'd mock us for that stuff. I remember this girl saying to me, I have a double wardrobe. I have a double garage. I didn't even know what that was. <laughs> <laughs> and rejection was a massive deal for me at Postgate School. And it set in into the depths of my being. And I I remember as a 12-year-old being desperate to get out of the school. Like, I, I didn't want to be there. I wanted to go to the furthest college I possibly could so that nobody would remember me, so no one could spread the rumor that I was a reject. And I went to Queen Margaret College. That's why I chose it. And I remember sitting with my friend Weasel, and I said to her, I've got a secret for you, Weasel, on the front lawn at QM. And she's like, yeah? And I'm like, I'm a reject. It was my label, and as I walked through the hallway of QM and the girls would be like, hey, Joe, hey, Joe, I'd be really confused. I was like, why is it that people are being so friendly to me? Why am I making so many friends when I'm a reject? And it took a long time for me to shake that off, to go, that's not who I am. That's not who God says I am. It wasn't what my friends were saying I am, but who cares about that? Who cares about what people think, what they say? Don't let it sink into your soul. Don't let it become the fiberglass of your experience that stopped you going further with Jesus. Allow him to remove it because that is what he wants to do. 
See, we live in such a spiritual world and Satan gets up to his tricks and so often we can think that our battle is against flesh and blood, that it's because this person said this to me or that situation happened or I'm struggling with, with how that person is acting around me or my dad did this or my, you know, you know the story. It's actually the way that Satan takes those situations and, and jams it over again and over again into our lives and we can become like this tree. This tree that becomes so bent, it's not in its true form. Because we believe every single lie that the enemy wants to sow into us. I don't know if you've ever sat across somebody and, and you know that it's really important that you share your faith. And, and because of your own sense of worth, you're like, oh, I can't do that. Man, that's a good trick of the devil. Eh? I remember sitting across from this woman. I barely knew her. She was a gardener for my my work that I was at, and God told me to tell her she adopted out a child when she was younger. And I was like, God, that is one weird thing for me to say. Hey, by the way, gardener, you adopted, you adopted out a child when you were younger. And so I had this argument with God in my head, and my sense of worth just wasn't really enough in Jesus, actually. It was in, in what people would think about me. How would they respond to me? Would I get rejected again? You know, that was kind of like hammered into my life by this point. And so I sat there and I was like, no, God, I'm not going to have that conversation. I'm not going to say that. And next thing she says to me as we're talking, I adopted out a child when I was younger. And I was like, dang it, dang it, that my own sense of fear of rejection caused me not to say, you know what, God already, God has told me this about you. I couldn't then say it, could I? Because it would look like I was just making it up. But if I'd said it before that, the power of what he was wanting to do, but that I was stepping into a place of limits a place of my own childhood experience, and, and Satan does this to us. He wants to trap us. And the way we interact in our marriage too, you know, that stuff can become a cycle. It's like, I believe this stuff. If I don't believe I'm good enough and I'm married, I had a bit of this happen to me as well, then I'm going to look for my worth elsewhere. I did that. I did that when I was 29 years old. And I was running a youth ministry here and I was picked up by a national team. They saw how successful we were with what we're doing. And they asked me to become a consultant to other youth pastors. So I sat on their team and they poured love on me, but they poured words on me. They called me words like, she's superwoman. And none of those words were from God. The expectation and bar that I then had in my head was so high, my worth became about what they said next. I'd lose weight before I went to national meetings just so I'd look good. I'd go shopping. Bok would start complaining about it. would be like, Joe, every time you go to national meetings, you buy a new outfit. You know, my, my worth had become tied up in what somebody says about me. I, I began to perform. And we can so quickly do that. It's like we can have situations that cause us to respond like this tree. And Satan laughs because a thief comes to rob, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, I come that they may have life and have it to the full. And he wants to see breakthrough. He has a plan and a purpose for every single one of us, doesn't he? And he wants to bring breakthrough. See, this is why Jesus came to die. This is why he chose to have that, that crown of thorns jammed on his forehead. But he wasn't just experiencing a physical pain as he was nailed to that cross. It was the fact that he was taking on the rejection and the guilt and the shame in every single situation that we face. And he was taking it on and he was saying, it is finished. When he rose up from the grave, it wasn't for us to lie back in the grave again. It is finished. The fiberglass has gone. It is finished. How many times do we see breakthrough? We come forward for prayer and we're like, yeah, I've got the freedom of God. I've got the fullness of Him. And we get back to our week and, and our mind starts telling us, oh, no, actually, you didn't really deserve that. Oh, no, you've got to do this, this, and this to get God's love. So you lie back in the tomb again. And Jesus is saying, I'm out of the tomb. I was set free from it so that you could be set free, so you could walk in me. 
and know my love and know my joy and know my peace that goes beyond all this understanding, beyond this earth. See, there's a really cool scripture that says this in Hebrews 4.16. Let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in this time of need. And I think sometimes the problem is when we're, when we're going after fullness of life, we think there's some kind of formula to it. And God's like, hey, there's no formula. Just come before me boldly. There's nothing you have to do to receive my love or walk in me other than say, here I am. I am available to you, God, to walk boldly, boldly in Him. Every single moment of every single day to walk what? Boldly in Him. You know, my grandpa, dad's dad, I formed a special relationship with him and I used to catch the ferry to go and see him and hang out in Picton and I was desperate for grandpa to know Jesus. So I'd share my faith, I'd tell him about the healings happening at church and And I really wanted him to know God. And when he got cancer, I went to go and visit him. And I sat next to his bedside. And I remember knowing that this could be it, that I'd never see him again. And so I thought I'd give it my best shot. And I said to him, you know, Grandpa, I want you to walk with Jesus. I want you to know God. And you just have to say this prayer and you'll know him. He'll love you. He'll accept you for who you are. And this is what he said to me. He said, Johanna, with the way that I have lived my life, why would God want me? I can't. I said, Grandpa, if you change your mind, tell Grandma to call me. And I waited. And the phone call never came. See, because the sad thing is for my Grandpa, is it caught up in his mind was the fact that he was not good enough. And I can bet you that it's based on the fact that his own father was so terrible to him that one day he's sitting in his new suit and he's real proud of himself as a young man and his father goes and picks up the pot of stew and just slams it over his head. That was his earthly father. So his, his fiberglass was the fact that Father God would never want him. And he believed that to his death. When actually the Bible says, come boldly. Do you have a formula? Do you have something that stops you from being able to lift your hands and worship, from stepping out, from giving everything you got to Jesus, from having fullness of life? When I was youth pastoring here a number of years ago, I used to have this formula in my head that God dealt with. And it was that if I ran a youth camp, I thought I'd better pray so much more for God's hand to move. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying so much more, but it's the fact that I thought that if I did that, that that's the only way that I could get God to move. And it dawned on me later on that actually God was already on the move, and He is so good and so loving that He's inviting me in to the space of prayer because He, because I matter to Him and because He wants me to partner with Him, that it's not all on my own shoulders. There wasn't some formula to this. It was just going, God, you know, like... Do your work. You're already at work. It's not about what I can do or what I can pray up, but how you move. How you move. Coming boldly before him. And, and then they're saying to God, you know, when I'm boldly before you, God, I'm, I'm willing to jump in your hand like a lump of clay. One of my favorite classes at school was art. Who loved art at school? Yeah. I loved art, and one of the things I loved about art is the fact that the teacher would give you a lump of clay and you could make it into anything you wanted. And there was not a little pair of hands in this lump of clay saying, wrestling me off, or a voice saying, stop, stop, don't, don't mold me. You know, this lump of clay does anything in the hands of its crafter. And that's all God invites of us. It's for us to go, I'm coming boldly before you. I know you love me, God, and you accept me that it is finished on the cross. And that I can be free in you. That I can lay back in you and say, mold me into anything that you want me to be, God. Do your work deep in me. You know, in Jeremiah 31, 3, I love this verse. I was looking and I was like, man, this is cool. It's for the Israelites, but I believe it's for us as well. It says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you with loving devotion. When God molds us, it's not this ugly process with this angry, hateful God. It's a God of, he's a God of love. 
When he says, release this to me, don't go down that path. Let go of that fiberglass. It's for our own good, no matter how painful it is. Because he loved us. He loves us. His love is everlasting. It will never disappear. You will never be able to go away from it if you say, God, I want your love in my life. He will lovingly mold you because that is who he is. When I was 19, I went to a key leader, Marty, who was leading the youth ministry at the time. And I was sick and tired of coming to our youth ministry at the time, where there were a whole lot of young people that would come and they were rough as guts. We had to get security guards on the doors at Hosanna during our youth ministry program because of what would happen, the fights that would break out and all that kind of thing. I was sick of giving my Friday nights up for that. I was like, I want to go hang out with my friends and have a good social time. Nothing bad, just want to have a good social time, you know, because I'd be crying after our youth ministry program every Friday. And so I said, Marty, I'm quitting youth ministry. And he was like, Joe, if that's what you want to do, you do that. And as... As he said that, the weight of responsibility lifted from my shoulders and I literally floated out of the church to my boyfriend's blue boy racer car and I slid it next to Bok and I told him what I'd done. And as I said it, I heard the voice of God say to me very clearly, Johanna, you are to do youth ministry. And as it sunk in, I started to cry. Like I was like, oh my gosh, for some reason I had this this prophetic kind of message, this is going to be a hard road. <laughs> but I resolved in my heart that if God called me into youth ministry, that I wouldn't just give a little bit of myself. That I would give everything, my time, my resources, my all. You know, last week, Bok just finished paying off his student loan. And part of his student loan was the amount that we invested in youth ministry. He took out money week by week from the government and it helped to pay for some of that. <laughs> Give him a clap for paying off a student loan. <laughs> we decided he, that we would give everything to it, and we did. And we saw a move of God that was so powerful, young people coming to know Jesus. And I'm in the youth scene now. It's what I do with my life. And the thing is, is that when God called me into it, he knew that there was nothing else that I would find more satisfying than using my gifts and strengths with young people. When I said God mold me, I had to say, hey God, if there's some stuff that you need to iron out of my life, I'm going to let you iron it out. I'm going to be in your hands. I'm going to say yes to even things that seem too hard for me. I'm going to let you have your way in me and through me. And I've got to say this, that I find nothing more fulfilling than seeing a young person give their life to Jesus. Because that's how God's gifted me. But how has God gifted you? What are the strengths that he's put in you? What is the calling in your life? If you look at your thumbprint, it's the only thumbprint that's ever existed in this world, ever will exist. And it's you, it's uniquely you, and God has uniquely got a calling on your life too. And it doesn't look the same as mine. But it is stunning in the fabric of the church as you become part of the body and acting in the things that he's called you to. And I've got to say, when you step into that, when you step into the call that God has for you, there is nothing more satisfying. But it's saying to him, yes, God. See, Ephesians 2.10, look at this verse here. It's a powerful verse. For we are his workmanship. He created us. He loves us in his image. Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. What is God calling you into? What is God requiring of you? Because I want to say this, he never calls you into something without going the journey with you. He is beside you, before you, he hems you in, past and behind. Maybe it's something he's calling you into in a relationship, in your marriage, in your workplace, in your family. Maybe he's calling you into something and you're going, God, I'm, I'm too scared. I, I've got these past situations that hold me up. And, and God is saying, I want you to allow me to take you past that moment of fiberglass into the place where you're going to be fed by me, into waters that you're scared of, that you're afraid of, so that you can see fullness of life here on earth. You know, a while ago, I was really struck by this the story in Haiti. 
this powerful story of this earthquake that happened, and it was a crazy earthquake because Haiti wasn't built well as a country, and so, so everything just fell over, you know, houses with rocks, all that kind of thing. And there's this little guy called Kiki. And the thing about Kiki is that he was trapped under the rubble of his house, eight years old, for eight days. And as he sat in the rubble, surrounded, it became like his tomb. And he listened to the cries of his little brother for water. And and as he cried out, his little brother slowly but surely died next to him. And Kiki was left alone. and, and, And his voice was getting hoarse, but he was crying out. And somebody heard him. And the rescue workers, they ran to him because there were barely any survivors at this point. And they started to take the boulders off, off this place, this cave that he was in. And they were taking boulder after boulder off. And finally they got to where Kiki was. And through the hole, they called out to Kiki and they said, Kiki, Kiki, come, come. And do you know what Kiki did? Kiki went further back into that tomb with his brother. And he said, no, no. See, he had gotten too comfortable. He was too comfortable in this cave. He'd been there for too long. And I'm asking you this morning, is there something that you're too comfortable in, that you've retreated in, that you've said, God, no more. No more, God, it's too hard. I can't heal that relationship I can't step out in this way. I can't belong here in this church again. And God is saying, that is not the story I'm writing of you. Come out. And the rescue workers, they they were calling him and they got his auntie over. And she's calling him. And finally, with courage, Kiki stepped up. And he came out and he reached his arms out. And this is the photo that they captured of Kiki as he came out of his tomb. He is smiling, right? And a journalist asked him later, Kiki, why did you smile at this moment? And he said this, I smiled because I was alive. And I smiled because I was free. Where do you need freedom this morning? What is something that you've believed for a long time that you need to let go of and, and leave the tomb? God, God never intended for Jesus to stay in the tomb. He intended for Him to rise again. He intends for you to rise with Him, to rise up, to rise up. You know, God is saying that there's gonna be a harvest in this church. He's calling us to rise up, to open our arms up to the world and say, come, come and receive what I have for you. Come, come and receive what God has in His house, His love. But where is the point of freedom that you're needing this morning? Where do you need to say, God, mold me. God, I give up this stuff. God, I am am hanging by, by a tree limb. And I know you have a purpose for my life, but I need you to come and rescue me. I need you to come and do what only you can do. The worship team are gonna come on this morning and I said to Adele that I was preaching this Sunday and I said, there's a message that I wanna bring. And then there is a message of freedom that God is wanting to do in this place. And for every single one of you in this room, I'm gonna pray a prayer in a second. And, and if there's something that you need to say, God, remove that fiberglass. Remove the lies that I believe, the way that I've operated so I can walk in freedom. I tell you this, as I've allowed God to do that in my life, I stand here this morning in His freedom because Christ has set me free. Are you free too? Are you free too? So I'm just gonna pray this prayer. And as I pray this prayer, we're not gonna muck around. If you need to respond in some way to this message, is there something that's hit you this morning? Maybe you don't know Jesus and And you need to be able to say, Jesus, I I invite you into my life to have a friendship with you. Remember, He just takes you as you are. There's nothing that needs to hold you back if that's you this morning. Or maybe you need to make a recommitment to Him. I'm gonna invite you in a second to stand up after this prayer if that's you. 
And we're going to come down the front. We're going to pray. The thing about this church that I love is the prophetic. People pray over you and boy, is it freeing. So I'm going to pray. Let's pray together. God, I want to thank you so much for what you did on the cross, Jesus. That the grave was left empty, that the tomb, no one was in because Jesus, you had conquered death. You had conquered our guilt. You had conquered our shame. You had conquered sin so that we could rise again with you, so that we didn't have to to remain in a place that this world might have told us that we are, but that we could walk into a space of purpose in you, of calling in you, of, of the things that are good in you, Lord. You have a call on every single life in this room, God, and Father, anything that would be a blockade, Like there's somebody in this room this morning, it's like you're trying to protect your heart. You've gone through experiences that are making you try and protect your heart, which makes relationships hard for you. To get close to relationships is difficult. And God's wanting to bring freedom to that this morning. He can do a healing and a miraculous work if you let Him. Step into it. Thank you, Jesus.